Okay, today is what a lot of people call Easter. And I'm not going to get into the pagan uh, celebration of Ishtar, and how it was ushered in, like many other holidays, by Constantine, the Catholic Church. But we prefer to call it Resurrection Day. And we are not one of those that are um, leaders of the Easter Parade. So anyway, um, many people are going to be, you know, doing their Easter egg hunts and their uh, new Easter outfits, showing them off at their churches. And they're going to be having their chickies and their Easter eggs and their colored uh, hard-boiled eggs and their chocolate Easter eggs and their chocolate Easter bunnies and their Easter bunny cakes and all of the other things that go along with it. Um, they're going to have their crosses. They're going to have their three crosses in their church's yard with the purple little material over it. They're going to have angels. They're going to have all kind of stuff and they're going to be singing the old rugged cross and Jesus keep me near the cross and in the cross and I surrender all and and um, between me and the cross and over the cross and on top of the cross and under the cross and you know uh, I'm surprised they're not using the cross like they do the broom and flying on it. But anyway, we're supposed to be looking to the resurrected Christ, not the cross. Christ did go to the cruel and rugged cross of Calvary, but he's not on the cross anymore, Catholics. And for you little baby in a manger worshippers, he's no longer in the baby either. I mean, no longer in the manger either. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now we've had, I need to get the Psalter and a hymnal. Um, but anyway, the first song that has been selected is page 79, and that's Psalm 76a. <clears throat> God the Lord is known to Judah, great his name in Israel. His pavilion is in Salem, his abode on Zion's hill. There he broke the bow and arrows, made the sword and the shield be still. Excellent art thou and glorious, coming from the hills of prey. Thou hast spoiled the valiant heart, wrapped in sleep of death thy way. Mighty men have lost their cunning, none are ready for the fray. Horse and chariot low are like. In the sleep of death's dark night, Jacob's God, thou didst rebuke him. Thou art fearful in thy might. When thine anger once is risen, who may stand before thy sight? When from heaven's I sent a sound, all the earth in fear was still. While to save the meek and lowly, God in judgment wrought his will. In the wrath of man shall praise thee, what remains is kept from ill. Make your vows now to Jehovah, pay your God what is his own. All then bring your gifts before him, fear is due to him alone. He brings low a pride of princes, he shall tremble at his frown. 
Okay, the next one that has been selected, Mark wants to sing 440, The Lily of the Valley, in this old school hymnal, 440. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care of him to grow. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptations he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach his goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Okay, the last one before we go over to the other part of the service is going to be Psalm 67, page 33a. 67, 33a. You want to start that, Mark? You righteous praise the Lord with joy. It's good that just men praise him for with thanks the Lord O oh, praise the heart and him string violently with skill resounding praises sing a new song to him praise. For upright is Jehovah's work, he does in all his work record his faithfulness and work, in justice and in doing right. Jehovah always takes delight, his mercy fills the earth. Jehovah's word the heavens make, and all the host of them are His breath is caused to be. He rolls the waters, he on he. He gathers all the mighty deep in caverns of the sea. Let all the earth, Jehovah, fear. Let all that dwell both far and near in awe before him stand. When he had spoken, it was done, and finished was each work begun when once he gave command. Dear Lord, we pray that you would go with us in the service. Pray that your word would be precious to us and that you would grant unto us understanding of your word by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for 
your continued presence in our lives. We ask that you would continue to draw us closer to you. In Christ's name, amen. In Isaiah, the 57th chapter, Isaiah, the 57th chapter, Isaiah says in the 15th verse, but For thus saith the High and Lofty One, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now I want to go on and I want to look down in the 19th verse. It says, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. Mm. The 21st verse says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Well, I want to look back at that 15th verse. It says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. This is speaking here of the triune God. The high and lofty one includes the pre-incarnate Christ. And we know that Christ was in heaven before he came as a baby down here on this earth. People don't want to think about that. There's a lot of people that are denying that Christ was before he was born. It says, whose name is holy, capitalized. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Here he shows the connection between God and his people. God has a people for himself who through the power of his Holy Spirit brings them new life and causes them to be contrite and humble over their sin. There are many people that don't ever show any remorse over sin. They go through their whole life. Many of them are baptized as little children and they grow up and they have this false assurance that because their parents and a minister when they were infants put water on their heads that they are automatically in the bride of Christ. Many of them have not heard messages on the violation of the not only the, the original sin in Adam but also their actual sins that they commit on a daily basis and the fact that they're dead in their trespasses and sin and are in need of a savior. Mary, the mother of Jesus, said, I rejoice in God my Savior. And many people have not ever um, come to a point of repentance because God has chosen not to impart his Holy Spirit in them and cause them to recognize that they're dead and to cry out to him in faith and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You notice the first thing I said in that was that he, God has chosen not to cause them to be born again. 
the spirit bloweth where it listeth, and no man knoweth the sound thereof. And so is everyone that is born of the spirit of God. And I think it's deception on the part of those who give a false assurance to people in their baptism as infants. I think it's deception. Just like I think it's deception when people say to someone that uh, you can live any way you want to. You can go out here and you can live like the devil, but if you're one of God's elect, it doesn't matter. That's not scriptural either. Paul said, shall we continue in sin so that grace will abound? God forbid. We've been chosen in him before the foundation to be conformed to the image of his son. Predestinated such. And if you're not conformed to the image of God's son, then the odds are you've never been predestinated. If you're still living like the devil... How can you say you're one of God's elect? We're supposed to make our calling and election sure. And of course, Christ is the one who paid the sin debt. And we're talking about today many will hear a message on the resurrection. But Paul said that if it hadn't been for the resurrection, we would be yet in our sins. That's what Paul said. Now, we know that um, we're told that Jesus Christ's purpose for coming to this um, earth was to save his people from their sins. And of course, A lot of people don't understand that Christ uh, had a specific purpose to come to this earth. A lot of people think that the reason that Christ came was to, um, you know, work miracles. Or the reason he came was to preach a social gospel. Um, a lot of people, their whole uh, preaching and their whole thrust of what they teach is the Sermon on the Mount. But Christ came to do a specific work. He didn't just come to preach on a mountain. He didn't just come to heal the sick. He didn't just come to reach out to the poor. And all of that was good. But he came for a very specific reason. He came to save his people from their sins. Recently saw a post on Facebook that said that um, there's no way that Jesus was not, did not die for everybody. And that did not in any way delineate his effectiveness for his elect. But if you stop and think about that statement, if Jesus Christ died for everybody, then if Christ's death did not mean something for whom he died for, it did delineate the effectiveness for his elect. You can't have it both ways. People always talk about, well, you're limiting Christ's atonement. No, we're making it more effective. You're the one that's limiting its effectiveness. You're limiting Christ's effectiveness in his atonement. Now, the real issue is that in this issue of particular redemption is that Christ um, through 
the Hebrew writer said that he gave his life a ransom for many. And that, that life that he gave was a sacrifice where he shed his blood and in the process of that sacrifice he became the sin bearer for the elect. He took on the sins of all of his elect and he made a sacrifice or an atonement for them. He did not make a sacrifice and atonement for everybody, every person without exception. He made a sacrifice for the atonement of God's elect. Whenever he made that sacrifice, it was for a specific purpose and a specific reason and a specific people. Had he made a sacrifice for all people, I can most certainly assure you that all people would be saved. But the Bible teaches that all people are not saved and that he gave a sacrifice for many. And he came to save his people from their sins. We are not boasting of that. We don't understand why God in his sovereign mercy and grace chose to show us his atonement and to, to provide atonement for our sins. In the 17th chapter of John he told us in his praying to his father he says I pray not for the world but for those that thou hast given me out of the world that thou will keep them through thy word tells us in John 6 that all that the Father has given me will come to me. And all that come to me I will in no wise cast out. He tells us in John 10 that my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and no man can pluck them out of my hand. And he also tells us in John 10 that there are many that try to climb up another way. They're thieves and they're robbers. In John 8, he tells, tells them that the reason you don't believe on me is because you are your father the devil and the works of him you will do. And so God's work is very particular for whom he chose from the foundation of the world. There are many that are denying election there's many that are denying effectual calling and a predestination and putting the free will of man on the throne that's what Dave Hunt did that's what Adrian Rogers did that's what Charles Finney did that's what John Wesley did that's what Pelagian did Pelagius did and that's what 99 the 99 hundreds percent of Christendom is doing. They're putting man on the throne. Today is supposed to be the day that we're supposed you know, recognizing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what God accomplished through his son in the resurrection. But many today are putting man on the throne on this what they call Easter Sunday. The dressing man all up. They're glorifying man. They're coloring Easter eggs. They're going in their Easter bonnets. And they're recognizing chickies. And they're recognizing man centered religion rather than God centered effectual salvation for his people. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? You know, I recently saw a blip on a post on Facebook. Jesus Christ does not create vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. 
All we have to look, do is look around us and see many, many people out there that appear to be vessels of wrath fitted for destruction by their own lifestyle, by their own lives and what they're doing. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How many times have we thought about the realities that people that want to oppose these great doctrines of grace will try to put man on the throne and say that God would not be just if he uh, was the author and the finisher of our faith because he would not allow man to freely choose to love him. That's what Adrian Rogers said. He would not allow man to freely love him, choose to love him. And so therefore, it would make man a robot. A robot. But yet, in another vein, Adrian Rogers would say, if one molecule went maverick, then God isn't sovereign. Well, these, you see the contradiction there? <laughs> the molecules that make up one, mole one molecule is one, many that make up every aspect of man. And so God is in control over these things. Even it tells us in his word that he is, uh, it says in John 3, that they would be manifest that you are wrought in God. And also it says in many places that even the bounds of our habitation are under his auspices. And in the ninth chapter of Romans it says, Hath not the potter power over the clay? It doesn't say, have not the, the clay have uh, control over the potter. It says, has not the potter power over the clay. But now, there's so many people out there that are trying to say that man has power over the potter. Let Jesus into your heart. Give God permission to work in you. Let God have his perfect will in your heart. Pray that God will let you be at the center of his will. Make God your all in all. I surrender all. All of this stuff. If you've surrendered all, my friend, it had anything to do with you. It had to do from beginning to end with God himself. If you're crying out to God for mercy and recognizing your need of the Savior, it didn't come from a spark of good within you because you were dead in your trespasses and sin. And it didn't come because you want to proclaim that you were created in the image of God. Like these health and wealth and crazy people on TBN try to say they're little gods. We're all little gods. We're all little messiahs. No. No. Hath not the potter power over the clay to make one lump unto honor and one unto dishonor? And so today, on this Resurrection Sunday, let us proclaim with all, with everything within our being, the majestic, sovereign, awesome, power of God and let us delineate uh, mankind he's and I, as Isaiah said that you're you're less than a grasshopper less than a grasshopper <laughs> I've been out where there's been lots of grasshoppers and you know what grasshoppers remind me a lot of our minions whenever you want to get close to them they jump away. They start hopping. Hoppity hoppity here. Hippity hoppity here. That's the Armenians. Hop over here for a while. Hop over here for a while. Hop over here. 
That's what a lot of the Armenians do in their marriages, too. That's the way they treat their marriages. But there's a covenant that is an unshakable covenant that was before, between the Trinity before the foundation of the world. And it's, it's not removable. And it's certain. And it's a decree by God. And it's that he will have a people for himself. And you cannot change it. You cannot alter it. It's irrefutable. And the question I have for everyone listening to this message today is, were you one of the people that was in that covenant? Are you one of those that was chosen before the foundation of the world? Are you one of those that have been recipients of God's grace? Charles Spurgeon made a good point one time. He said, my whole theology rests on one question, or one of affirmation, actually. Jesus Christ died for my sins. His whole theology rested on the affirmation, Jesus Christ died for my sins. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, did Jesus Christ die for your sins? <laughs> if he didn't die for your sins, my friend, you're in big trouble. <laughs> but if he did die for your sins, you don't have anything to worry about. You can rest in the sovereign, completed work of Jesus Christ. So to, we're going to sing this song now. I think my wife was telling me she thought that uh, Charles or John we Charles Wesley wrote Christ to Rose, right? No, maybe not. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, it's in page 146. But we're going to change the words of this song just a little bit. Make it a little bit. No, it says Robert Lowry in here, so I don't know. Um... Now, it says, Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Now it says, Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor to the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Now, um, you can call him his saints, or you can call him his elect, you can call him anything you want to. So, anyway, we'll just sing this song. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. From the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior, 
He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave He rose, with the mighty triumph for His foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and He lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, He arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Dear Lord, we're glad you sealed your word in heaven, we pray, amen. Father, we also are grateful that we can be confident that you died for our sins according to the scriptures you rose again according to the scriptures and you're coming again according to the scriptures help us to look forward to your coming with the hope that we will be forever and eternity with you we 